Your Excellency, welcome to the program. Thank you, program. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. There are these rising cases of abandoned babies. I've read a lot of articles that have condemned this, and uh, some of your colleagues in this same uh, NGO business have condemned it. But there, are, there is this rising, we have these rising cases of uh, abandoned babies. What is the way out? Well, um, thank you for having me. And um, now the question of having abandoned babies, it's, uh, it's a complicated thing and it's a social issue. Because why, do, uh, why are the babies abandoned in the first place? That's what the question that we have to look at. In most cases, I don't think any woman or any girl would want to abandon her baby. So if you look at most cases of these uh, abandoned babies, you will find that it might be maybe a, a single girl who is not married, um, or even cases where a woman has gotten pregnant and cannot afford, she's married, but they cannot afford to keep the baby with the present um, economic situation in the country. Mm -hmm. And so it's easier for them to abandon the babies. So I think the only way out is to tackle the problem right from the root of it. And what is the root of it? The social issues that we have in the country. And then most importantly, to be able to sensitize women and general, the general public on how to prevent unwanted pregnancies. Because in most cases, you have an unwanted pregnancy. And how do you prevent that? By ensuring that you have adequate and um, accessible family planning methods available. And uh, it's, one of the most, it's one of the most important things about reproductive health issues in women, having access to good quality and accessible and cheap uh, family planning methods. They are actually widely available in the country, but only about 17% of our women in the country access it. A lot of it has to do with lack of, edu uh, lack of knowledge about it or misconceptions about um, family planning. For example, because we have so many religious beliefs and cultures, some people think that um, um, family planning is about stopping your uh, stopping pregnancies in, in, in entirety. But basically, what family planning does is allows a woman to plan when she wants to be pregnant, and when that happens, that means that pregnancy will not will definitely not end up as an abandoned baby with an abandoned baby. So we need to find an avenue to increase the sensitization and um, the distribution of these family planning commodities to women. And we can do that by, um, by well, government already has a lot of family planning clinics all over the country, but we need to sensitize women to come and access these services. So we need our political, our political leaders, our religious leaders, and as well as our traditional leaders to sensitize their people to it. And why I would say religious leaders is because we are a very religious country. We have the Christians and the Muslims. The Catholics don't believe in, um, in the formal birth control, but they have their own natural methods of birth control, which are actually effective when done properly. And we incorporate that into our sensitization messages. This, as well as the Muslims, some of the Muslims don't believe in family, in family planning, especially when it comes to permanent birth control. But when you have the religious leaders explaining to their congregation that, for example, in the Muslim uh, faith, that these family planning commodities are to space your families, not to stop the family from happening. And that is one of the reasons why the Muslim scholars say there's no, they don't allow family planning. They, some of them believe that you are stopping the woman from giving birth, and that's not the case. What you do is to space the families. So if you have a combination of all these leaders giving the correct message to our women and our girls, then I think we, that is one right step towards avoiding this kind of problems. I think uh, if we want to talk about infant mortality rate, too, it may go along that line, well, education definitely. and enlightenment. Yeah, de definitely. How much of education and enlightenment is your NGO putting in place? Oh, quite a lot of it, actually. Uh, because most of what we do um, in terms of uh, advocacy and sensitization, it's on maternal and child health. We, um, we are, what, are, what my, my foundation is called RAISE Foundation, by the way, and it's an acronym. Okay. And the, what the acronym means is the R is for reproductive health rights, the A is for advocacy, and that is advocacy on all our maternal, um, on maternal mortality issues and so on, and infant health. Then um, I is for the interventions that we perform, 
S is for safe spaces and E is for empowerment. All of these go together in ensuring basically that we have a reduction in infant and uh, uh, maternal mortality. And then we also, our education, the advocacy we do on education is to encourage the girl-child education. That is the most important one for us because if you have a girl who is educated, you are starting from the bottom. A child, a girl who is educated is likely to be empowered. And an empowered woman means she can make the right decisions to go to the hospital when she needs it, when her child needs it. And she is also empowered financially, that she does not have to wait for her husband or somebody else to give her the money for her to access the services that she needs to improve on her health as well as her child's health. So these are the strong points that we use in our organization to, read, to send out the message. Good. Now, what do you consider to be the most ravaging ailment the Nigerian woman faces? While answering this question, I wanted to talk about prevention. Wow. Well, my NGO was uh, created based on my need to see how I can give my contribution to, to stopping maternal death. For me, I think maternal mortality is one of the things that causes the greatest death in women in Nigeria. Not cervical cancer? No, not cervical cancer. Although cervical cancer and breast cancer are the second commonest causes of death of women from cancer, from okay. non-communicable diseases. Okay. All right? But maternal mortality takes away up to 58,000 women per year in Nigeria. Nigeria has the highest number of maternal mortality, has the highest number of maternal deaths in the world compared to, together with India. We are at par with India. The number of women who die mm -hmm. from maternal death. So I, for me, I think that is the biggest problem. And what is the biggest problem? Why do we have this? Because they are preventable. Like you said, as you talk about prevention, the prevention for maternal death is to have skilled services. What do, I, what do I mean by skilled? Having a skilled midwife, a skilled doctor, or a skilled health worker that will manage a woman's pregnancy, manage her delivery, and manage her after delivery. Most of our women, I will speak about my state, for example. Yeah. We have over 75% of our women giving birth at home. They don't come to the hospital. And most of them would die from five major, from five major causes bleeding after pregnancy, or infection, or um, a, a hypertensive diseases in pregnancy that we call eclampsia or preeclampsia, or from complications following miscarriages or abortions. These are the commonest causes of death from women with pregnancy-related causes, and all of them are preventable. How do we prevent them? Proper antenatal care, proper delivery, and then Deliver, and then proper care afterwards. And this has to be a concerted effort between the government, the people themselves, and able, for them to be able to access the correct services that they need. A lot of our women do not access this because of poverty mm. and lack of education. There is a correlation between education and death in our maternal in women. I will give you an example. For example, the Southwest has the highest number of educated women in Nigeria. It also has the lowest number of women who deliver at home, while the Northwest and the Northeast have the lowest number of educated women or girls in Nigeria and have the highest number of maternal deaths. Can you see the correlation? Mm, right. Because a woman, as I said it before, a woman who is educated is likely to go to hospital, is likely to have money, and is likely to be able to make the decisions she requires to take care of herself and her baby. This is just the bottom line of it. So we need to increase our girl-child education, we need to increase our hospital services and access to these services to, so that our women can survive. In terms of breast and cervical cancer, which are also major killers of women, one of the best ways in which we can prevent those is by early detection. Breast cancer, for example, the best chances of survival is by detecting breast cancer early. Majority of our women do not come to hospital until the cancer is in the late stage, and by that time, there's very little that can be done. But in early stages, it can even it can be cured to a certain to a certain level. How do we detect breast cancer early? Women to be able to do self breast examination every month, and with the aim of detecting if their breasts are different, there's a problem. They go straight to the hospital and they check. That's one way of doing it. The most effective way of detecting it is by doing regular mammograms. A mammogram is a picture, 
like an x-ray of the breast that will detect a, a mass or a problem in the breast even before a woman starts having symptoms. Mm. So if a woman has regular mammograms, she is likely to, de to detect her cancer if there is one on time to be able to deal with it. For cervical cancer, in fact, cervical cancer is one of the best examples of how prevention can, uh, can be 100% effective. In cervical cancer, the changes that occur that lead to cancer can be detected years before it becomes cancer through what we call a pap smear or through some other visual examinations, which, by the way, my own foundation does. We do screening um, programs for breast cancer as well as cervical cancer. If a woman has regular pap smears, it detects the precancerous stage, but it, it means it detects a cancer before it even occurs. And then you can treat the woman, and then there's no chance of her having cancer again. And for what we do, because the pap smears are very expensive, not everybody can access it, what my foundation does is we go to the rural areas, to the grassroots, and conduct massive um, screening exercises for the women in that environment. And when we see them, we're able to treat them for their precancerous cases and detect those who have early stage cancer and refer them for treatment. So these are ways in which this kind of things can be pre uh, prevented. Now, you, you, you float an NGO, you are a medical doctor, yes. you are the first lady of this state. How has how have these positions, how have these positions enhanced healthcare delivery in Niger State? Well, um, I think in, it has it has actually done quite a lot. For example, now because of um, the work I'm doing in the maternal uh, maternal mortality prevention cases, we have come, we have um, I have partnered with the, the foundation has partnered with the Ministry of Health. And we're working together to start a, a statewide program, which I'm hoping would start before the end of the year, specifically targeted at preventing deaths from uh, hemorrhage and okay. hypertensive diseases, which are the two most common case causes of death in women. Um, I work in the hospital, uh, the general hospital in the state capital, Emina. I, I conduct uh, clinics maybe once a week and then theater sessions and so on. And I think that has enhanced the way the hospital um, so far works. We have a neonatal and maternal hospital um, newly commissioned in the state now where I go to work and I think that has really improved maternal uh, health indices within the state capital and we're able to um, extend services from that hospital to the primary health care centers within Chenchega local government and I believe in the near future we shall be able to extend those kind of services to the other local governments in the state. And I'm working very closely with the Ministry of Health, and that has really, I think, um, encouraged me to continue what I'm doing. And I, and I think it has also encouraged the staff of the Ministry of Health to co also continue what they're doing. All right. Uh, finally, we want you to address the women. They are listening to you. Mm -hmm. Please go on. Well, I think what I would say to women in general is that... Um, Women are the fabric of society. They're the fabric of family. When a woman is ill, her family is ill. Mm. But when a woman is healthy, her family is healthy. So I want to, first of all, congratulate women for being what they are to their families. A lot of them do not have the support that they think they, that they are supposed to have. But they don't know that without them, their families won't run properly. So I would give kudos to women for that. The second thing I would say is being the fabric of that family. I would encourage you to try as, many, as, as much as possible to be the best that you can be to your family. And how do you do that? Make sure you empower yourself. Education, I think, is key. For women who are not privileged to have education, I encourage you to put your girl child in school. The girls are just as important as the boys. And right now, girls are at a, at a disadvantage. Please put your girl child in school and encourage her to be the best that she can be because she can be that. She can even be better than a man. Although uh, my colleague my colleague here may not agree, but the, the, the saying about what a man can do, a woman can do better, I really believe we can all do we can all do it together. But support your families by being the best that you can and empower your girls by an education. Thank you very much, Your Excellency.